and it, it kind of helps me lead off um, what I want to talk about, and that's science, tech, engineering, and math education. And in fact, Rachel earlier today um, helped pull that little sexy acronym up for me, so it's a little easier to, to introduce it. But what I like to do when I talk to my students is to have them come to me to class ready to talk about some problems that they've seen um, that, that, that are important to them to solve. And, and this cupcake reminds me of one that's really been on my mind lately, and that's diabetes. You might say, well, why is she talking about diabetes? Well, um, it's a problem. Diabetes is a real problem. I venture to say if I asked anyone in here to raise their hand that knows someone with diabetes, you know, we'd have about half the audience put their hands up. It's an epidemic. Um, the American Diabetes Association um, just announced that uh, there's about 8.5% of this country that's affected by diabetes. Um, that's, that's a significant number. It's a real problem. Um, and, and if you want to add to that problem, about 180,000 people died last year of, of causes directly related to diabetes. So to, to really make it sobering, I don't want to depress you, but what that really means is by the time I get to the end of my 18-minute talk, we could potentially lose six people to this disease. And so that's a real problem. Um, and it's one of many. This plastic bottle, which was already up here very handy, is another thing. Um, how many of us go to events with plastic bottles? Did you know that about 50 billion of these, I just learned this because I had to look it up. I like to learn these new things about problems. About 50 billion of these water bottles are purchased every year in this country. Okay, and you think, well, that's a lot of bottles, but guess what? It takes about 18 million barrels of crude oil to produce these 50 billion. That's about 60, 66 million, I think is what they said, gallons of gasoline. So why in the world are we using such a precious natural resource to make a bottle, a plastic bottle? Aren't we smarter than that? You know, can't we solve this problem in other ways? And, and I think the answer is yes. Um, you know, I live in this world of, of solving problems, and I would say that at least the two examples I brought to you today, um, one way we're going to solve those is, is to really focus on how do we create the next generation of big thinkers, of problem solvers, of kids that are creative, undoubtedly, but also come to the playing field with an understanding and a passion and the skills that it takes to bring science, technology, engineering, math, or STEM, as I'll say for the rest of the talk, because saying science, tech, engineering, and math is a mouthful, um, but to bring their STEM skills and their STEM passion into the education pathway and into to careers to help solve these world-class problems. And we really need to pay attention to this, because you know what? If you look at some of the statistics right now, less than 15% of the kids in this country get enough science and math in their K through 12 experience to even have the choice to pursue a STEM career path and go into university STEM programs, or even at the very least, get an entry-level job as a lab technician in a company that does this kind of work. And if that's not enough to convince you, you need to pay attention, um, let's, let's kind of come home to our own backyard. Did you know, and I'm not going to say which districts, we have, a, we have a number of districts in our own backyard in which elementary and middle school kids get 45 minutes of science a week. A week, not a day, a week. And I just kind of got a chill from that because as a science geek, it kind of makes me just a little upset, I have to say. I don't like it. And you shouldn't like it either. Um, if you look at the last 15 years of science scores in our eighth and fourth graders in Utah, we were, we've dropped from number 10 in state rankings to number 28 in 2009, the last 15 years. Um, and so whether you believe in scores or not, it doesn't matter. It tells us something. We've got to start doing something. We've got to do something big. We gotta do something creative and innovative and get our kids loving science again and technology and engineering and math. And we gotta give them the programs and the opportunities that help them become the problem solvers that deal with these things. Because you know, we don't have a choice. We've gotta deal with this. Um, and so, um, and one other thing I wanna tell you too, I just read a report, the US Department of Labor um, said that between now and 2024, 15 of the 20 fastest growing job occupations gonna require science and math. You know, we've got a future to look out for um, and give our kids those options. So um, let me fast forward to what I really want to talk about, um, you know, how do we get kids into these programs. About six, seven years ago, a handful of colleagues and I came together and we said, we want, we want to be a part of the solution. We want to help get these kids excited again. Um, and we said, you know, we need an underlying philosophy that we all agree on. You know, something we embrace together and, and move forward with to make our, our efforts successful. Um, it aligns with the, the, the theme of this session, which is integration. You know, integration might mean something different to you in your world and something different to other people in their worlds, but in our world, what it meant 
So we had to come together with a common vision, and we had to share our resources, and we had to move together as, as a, a, a common unit towards some goals that would make sense to help create that next generation of problem solvers. Okay, and what do I mean by us? Who's the us in this equation? Well, we had community, our parents, our, our museums, like the Leonardo, higher education partners, university, colleges, and very, very important here, industry. Traditionally, we didn't have industry really, truly integrated into our efforts. Um, and then um, my offices, you know, it's about time state government stepped up and put our money where our mouth was, right? And so we had the Governor's Office of Economic Development where I reside, Department of Workforce Services. But most importantly, if we're going to pull all of these people together that had been doing things but really kind of on their own, we had to put public education right in the heart of this. This was our glue. And I'm not going to tell you um, something you probably don't already know, but these guys, they are the glue. The public education partners I have worked with in school districts are fantastic, and they helped to move us forward. Okay, now again, Rachel introduced this concept in her talk, and it's an old acronym we've all been working from in this area called STEM, okay? Um, and this was something the National Science Foundation put out several years ago that said, you know, science and math can't just be academic efforts. They have to have tech and engineering to give them some teeth, a little muscle on them, some application. I want to propose to you today that that's not enough anymore. Um, and, and I'm kind of excited because being the geek I am, I actually get to, for the first time, put an eye in front of something. I mean, everybody else gets to do it. <laughs> they get put it in front of something. So today's my day of glory. Um, I'm going to put the eye in STEM. Um, and this was fun. Um, and you know, you can probably guess, well, what's the eye in all of this? Well, it's more than one eye. Um, it's really that integration, that underlying philosophy that my colleagues and I, um, bless our hearts, I love them, really embraced, but with a liberal dose of innovation and inspiration. And most importantly, we decided we're not doing anything unless we can show it works. Um, this is time, this is money, uh, it's a lot of passion, but let's make sure that the impact we get out of these projects that we're going to put together to try to get kids interested in science and in STEM to solve these problems has the right impact and that we can tell people about it and it compels them to do something, okay? So in, in the next few minutes, what I want you to remember as I talk about these projects, that this is the, this is the heart and soul behind these projects. Um, some of them have been going on longer than others. Some are fairly new. But I'm just going to give you kind of the, the vision and spirit without killing you with the details. Um, I, you probably haven't eaten enough cupcakes to keep you awake for that, and not enough sugar. Um, so this next this project I want to talk to you very quickly about was really came about um, as an opportunity from an experience I had about seven, eight years ago. It was the first time I walked into a high school biology classroom, and I saw kids taking turns reading a biology textbook. And I remember thinking, oh my god, you got to be kidding me. There's no way we're ever going to get kids to think they can solve problems with their STEM skills, their science, their tech, their engineering math skills, solve these problems. If that's what they think science is about, ugh, yuck. And so we had an opportunity to do something about it. And, the, and the, the something that we did was we put another eye in this. We put industry in it. We said, you know, that's where the rubber hits the road. It's in the application. It's with the companies. And they're the ones that can bring some real meat to this and give the kids something fun to work on. And so working with some wonderful colleagues in higher ed and public ed and the industry that's not shown in this, we came up with this wonderful project in 2004 called the Nova Bio. And this is a contract research organization in which kids work on projects that we contract from local life science companies. These kids aren't reading textbooks. They're not even dissecting earthworms like we all used to do in biology labs. If you walk into these labs, what you'll see is a group of high school and college kids at a bench talking about their project and the results that they're working on to come up with a new marker for early diagnosis of ovarian cancer. You might go over to this other table and you might find some kids that are looking at organisms from the Great Salt Lake and wondering what kind of new, fun, biochemical characteristic they're going to find in this organism that's going to help solve a novel problem out there. Um, and this is cool science, and these kids are getting it, and they're saying, I can solve problems. I can go out and do this. Get out of my way. That's a Nova Bio, and this, my friends, is inspiration. These kids are fun, and they're getting it done. OK, so let's fast forward to another project. Um, very similar in nature, but different. We said, you know, 
if contracting projects from companies is doing such a great job with these guys, why can't we bring industry and integrate industry even more? And we said, you know, they're loving the contract projects. What if we had companies, startup life science companies, right there in the facility, down the hall from where these kids are taking their classes, their science classes? A lot of people said, you've got to be out of your mind, Gets. You've done some pretty stupid stuff. But you really think a for-profit startup company is going to put itself in an education facility? Well, let's see. Bring in some partners from higher ed, government, our U-Star. Um, we have also um, public ed, and we have industry. You mix it all up, and what do you get? Bioinnovation's Gateway. This is one of my favorite projects. This is actually a business incubator for life science companies that's in the Granite Technical Institute. It's in a technical institute, a high school facility. It's literally right down the hall from where the kids take their schools. These startup companies come in. They agree to be teachers, mentors, take interns on, and the kids come in and they work elbow to elbow with CEOs, VPs of research, marketing guys, and they learn what it's like to be an entrepreneur, to get an idea out of here to that bench and see if it's actually going to move into the commercialization pipeline. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity. Now, maybe that's not enough for kids. And what they want to do is innovate something on their own. We've got another great project out of this. We have a contract. Um, with Intermountain Healthcare, and nurses and physicians who have ideas in the hospitals can bring them to BioInnovations Gateway to our kids, and they actually get to sit there and do the design, a new design, a redesign on a device that might solve a problem in the hospital. And very quickly, we had um, our first, this has been going on the last, we haven't even celebrated our year anniversary on this project yet. And the first three months, we had a 17-year-old girl that worked with a nurse to do a redesign on an IV clamp for infant IV tubing, and the redesign allowed for the nurse to be able to unclamp it and reclamp it with one hand. 17-year-old girl, after three months, wrote a patent, and she's also part of the conversation with a large medical device company to get a license agreement going, a licensing agreement going. You think this kid's hooked? Yeah, yeah, she's destined for big things, for solving some problems. Um, it gives me the chills. This is, this is just the start of this project. Um, Okay, so in the last few minutes, I want to shift gears a little bit. You know, these projects really brought innovation and inspiration to these kids in these very unique projects where industry was integrated in. Did I use all my eyes? I think I got all the eyes in there. <laughs> um, but now I want to say this wasn't enough. We knew it wasn't enough. We knew um, that, uh, that we had to get the kids excited earlier. And, and how do we do that? Well, if you talk to the kids and you ask them, what do you think a scientist is? Um, you know, I actually was kind of offended. I'm like, I'm not that geeky. No, I'm not that. I'm a scientist. You know, and we said, you know what we got to do with these kids? We got to get rid of the lab coats. We got to get, get rid of the, the pocket protector image. And we got to show kids that science and engineering and math is more than just what they, they're used to seeing. You know, get rid of the lab coat stereotype. And let's look at what they love. What do they do? What do they what do they spend their day doing? Well, they ride bikes. You know? And so that's where you bring in, you take away the lab coats, you take away the pocket protector, and you put on a little Lycra, a few bikes, <laughs> <laughs> bring in higher ed, public ed, and, and what do you get? You get a program called Face of Fitness. Um, this is a phenomenal program where what we do is we say, OK, if you can't beat them, join them. What are the kids passionate about? They love skiing. They want to play a better game of football. The parents want them to have fewer head injuries. Um, but what happens is we let the kids know, you know, being an engineer doesn't mean you go out and you redesign a diaper folding machine that folds more diapers per minute. You know, okay. You know, some people do that. But you know what engineering is? That bicycle that you're on? An engineer designed that. And a material scientist came up with the carbon fiber composites to make it lighter and faster. Your football player? Those helmets, engineers spend their time trying to figure out how to make a better, safer, lighter football helmet. Scientists spend a lot of time, as we saw with Chris Johnson's talk this morning, coming up with cutting edge imaging techniques to try to figure out just how many times can the head take a hit before you get some serious head trauma. And we try to get the kids to understand that science is everywhere around them. You know, it, if you know the science of food and nutrition, maybe you can understand how to run faster, have better performance. Um, it's everywhere, and that's what Face of Fitness is. It gets rid of the lab coats and the pocket protectors and puts science right where it belongs, 
where the kids have fun and where they play. Okay? Um, this is a great program. It's just off the ground about the last year and a half, and we're having fun with it. So are the kids. And then finally, in the last few minutes, um, we, we've got a very new program I kind of want to roll out, and it's very new, so it comes with a disclaimer. We're just kind of looking to see what this is going to do for us. But it, it really does something. It, it was an eye-opener for us. We were doing all these fun, cool, crazy things, things that people said, you're an idiot for trying it. And we thought, you know what? One of the problems we're seeing in all these programs is math, quite simply, math skills. It really... It, held kids up from feeling very, you know, feeling successful about some of the things they do. And so he said, maybe it's time to go back to the basics. We're having fun, but maybe the fundamentals really are important here. And, and uh, we heard, again, going back to Rachel's talk, you can tell I got a lot out of your talk, but asking the right questions and, and seeing where are our problems, where do they exist, and asking the right people. So we started talking to our, our teachers and saying, what do we need to do? And they said, third grade. Go to third grade and get the parents involved. And we said, well, OK. Sounds kind of interesting. So we, uh, in this particular program, we get a very committed third grade teacher and all of her wonderful students. And what you don't see here is this was the final partner we integrated into one of our projects, the parents, the community. And what we did is we said, OK, parents, tell us what's going to help you. Help your kid get inspired about math in third grade and keep them inspired. You know, let's not let them lose their love for math. Um, and this seemed to be the critical juncture, according to the teachers. So what we have is a wonderful program called Math Review. And like I said, it's very new. But it's also kind of a new strategy that says, let's give parents the tools to help them help their kids at home and inspire the parents with the kids. Um, and so far, it looks pretty good. We're going to see if we can't, uh, as going back to one of our earlier talks, scale this one up, figure out how to get it to scale. Um, and so in the last few seconds, <laughs> integration. You bring some committed people together from industry, higher education, public education, the kids and their parents, um, government, dare I say, and you put them all in the same mix and you say, let's get a common vision, let's put a little bit of I back in STEM, and uh, let's get these kids thinking about being big, big thinkers, and get them thinking that they too can be a part of solving these world-class problems. Because you know what? If we don't, we're going to be in trouble. We need these kids. And so I hope I inspired you to integrate, have a little impact, and be innovative. And thanks for your time. I really appreciate it.